Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast, the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT to discuss their lives, their journeys, their ambitions and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. A man that's raced the greatest motorsporting event in the world is Steve Plater and you're alongside me. Steve, have you been um, you've been checking out any uh, any of the reviews online? Yeah, a little bit. Watching, just watching what's going on. In all fairness, yeah, it's like, people seem to like this podcast. Well, yeah, it surprises well, me. I'm, yeah, you're not doing a bad job. In all fairness, <laughs> they say the band. Do I sound surprised? Yeah, a little bit. They say the banter between me and you is is what keeps bringing them back, not the Healthy. guests. So maybe we could just sack the guests off, and me and you ah, could just. No, we can't do that. We have a chat. Um, before we get into this podcast, I'm just going to throw this out. The time of recording. Obviously, we're a few weeks further down the line now, but some bigger news that has nothing to do with our guest. But Nathan Harrison has just been announced as a teammate with with John McGuinness, which is, um, I mean, Nathan's gone from, let's not say zero, but, you know, relative newcomer to to factory Honda rider. That's massive news, really, isn't it, for him? Yeah, it's a great platform, you know, and especially to have the help from John McGuinness. Yeah. You know, all that experience and time. And hey, Nathan's a good kid and a good rider anyway. And uh, I spent, I haven't known him for that long. I spent some time with him skidding down in, in the water and uh, for, the, for the launch last year. But yeah. uh, good kid with a great future and uh, just a, a great outlook, especially on the TT. Do you think the, the timing of that ride is good for him? Or do you think he needs... Like, is there going to be any pressure on him to perform? Because he's still any still competitor. New. Obviously, he's going to put pressure on themselves. Mm. But I don't believe um, Nathan will be putting pressure on himself to win. He'll be putting on you know, pressure on himself, obviously, to improve as much as possible. Which is which is great. He's, he's got a good head on his shoulders. He really has. And how far do you think he could go with that bike? What God, what are we saying? Yeah. Like, move into that top five? Well, yeah, it's it's not going to be easy. You know, no. he's obviously got experience already. He knows where he's going and what he's doing. Um, but realistically, he'll be. I'm, realistically, I'll, I think he'll be kind of looking at top seven. Yeah, and this can this this can perfectly segue us into our guest because we're going from brand new TT star to a stalwart within the TT paddock. Been there, done it. Sixty five. I think I think my dad's sixty five. And I was proud of watching him going round Darley Moor <laughs> on a track day. But this guy, he's still there at the TT and he's he, he doesn't look like he's quitting anytime soon. A great guy. And not just him, obviously, his, his wife raced. But, you yeah. know, so it's uh, within the family. And uh, I'm looking forward to this one. It's going to be a good one. Let's yeah. get him on. John Alden. This is your intro, John. John Holden. That's it. That's all we need. Because everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows what you do. But prior to this podcast starting, before we get into the, the main question, the first question, we were just chatting um, about you having peppermint tea in the morning, how much of an athlete you are. And what's what's a bit frustrating for me is I'm the youngest out of us three, and I feel the least athletic compared to John. I wouldn't say you are visually. No, you know, you don't oh. look visually. Yeah, well, yeah, you look quite trim, actually. Oh, thanks, High five. I, I, I appreciate that. How dare you? Let's make his day before we set off. And then... But you just said like, that you, you collected your, your first ever pension. But you're, yeah. still, you're still looking trim. You're still looking like you can uh, wrestle a, a sidecar around the Isle of Man. Well, I'm sure I can. It's just... Uh... You can't stop the age thing, can you? And it's just a number. I, I don't feel any different than I did 20 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I stopped eating wheat. So that means no bread, no cakes, That's no biscuits. Problem. And that was, I read a book called Wheat Belly that my sponsor Ian Barnes gave me. And, uh, yeah, I thought I'll give up that. And I have done. And I feel loads better without it. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Warburton. <laughs> no, no, trust me, I keep Warburton's in, in plenty in plenty of holidays. Oh, that's all right. I'm going to carry on feeling rough. <laughs> <laughs> so the podcast always starts with the same question. You might have heard a few podcasts in the past, um, but and and this is this is a question that you can go back to any year. Yeah, yeah. Of over the last seventy years. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite, but it feels it some days. <laughs> that tap on the shoulder, you're rolling up through the start line, and it must have felt different at different points in your career, knowing that you, you know, you're fighting for a win, or you know you're not going to be competitive that time. But how does it feel as you roll up to that start line, and how has it changed throughout the years? 
Well, the first time I went there was number 99, and there was 103 sidecars on the grid. Bloody hell. Wow. What year was that? Uh, 1988. Which is like I was I was th three years old. It's yeah, but um, <laughs> that was yeah, four. and in front of me was Roy Hanks, mm -hmm. which uh, which was somewhat special then. Do you know what I mean? Like setting yeah. off behind right, I had my orange jacket on, and I'm there and I'm papping myself. <laughs> just, yeah, but it was something I always wanted to do since a kid. I used to go there with my mum and dad and that. So to set off, and I, I couldn't believe that I was actually, you know, doing the TT. Mm -hmm. So yeah. What, just watching, looking down Glen Country Road, seeing seeing the road disappear, and then all of a sudden, oh, you're away. And it, but it must have changed <clears throat> as you gain experience. Yeah. As you as you head towards the front of that grid, does it change or does it stay the same? Because, like I said, you're now fighting for for victories and fighting for potential podiums. Yeah, it it, it does change, and uh, I think your early days, your expectation wasn't on yourself, wasn't as as much. You know what I mean? Whereas now, I. I'm disappointed if I don't turn right when I when I go up the return road. Do yeah. you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it is different, but it's it's just fantastic. It, I don't, you know, I'm, unless you've done it and Steve has, it's like so nothing just, nothing better than setting off on them empty roads and and it's just the same now. It just feels the same as when I when I first started. The, yeah. the buzz is still there. It's not a chore. I, I just look forward to it and but that you sat there with the guy's hand on your shoulder and then and then you go and then and you just see it's usually I usually sit off number two and see Ben and Tom just go over the crest and right come on with a race on here chasing them down so you, you had no expectations 1988 you know of results or anything and I guess obviously never in your wildest dreams did you think you'd still be doing this 35 years later oh I knew I would be yeah <laughs> 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 no no I, I mean I surprise myself sometimes, do you know what I mean? And I'm still as keen and still as hungry to do it. But uh, yeah, then it was it was just to be able to do it. It was just, was, you know, like I say, I, I went with mum and dad and stayed in the, it was called House Stray Holiday Camp, which was at top of Onca. And it's, this, the relics are just there now. You could see the like <laughs> swimming pools being half filled in and the old buildings are falling down and that. But I went there with me, my mum and dad and my grandma and my, my mum and dad used to go off and leave me looking after my grandma where they went for a few beers and that into, into clubhouse or whatever it was. <laughs> and then I'd sneak off up to, uh, I'd walk from there, top of Onken, uh, up to the, the pits and that and uh, watching them. It used to be called Weighing In then. The um, Weighing In? Yeah, it wasn't scrutiny yeah. and the, the uh, Weighing In and there was like a big tent and they'd, they'd roll the bikes onto a, like a platform and they scrutineer them on that and then they'd put them into another big tent and that, that was it, they were they were held there. And I'd watch Agostini and Elwood and and Reed and all, you know what I mean? And it mm. was like, yeah, all I ever wanted to do, but it was... So uh, were you holidaying there <coughs> because it was the Alamo yeah, and the TT? Yeah, my dad, my dad was a fan and yeah, right. we just used to... Yeah, that was our summer holiday, going, going to the Alamo, a bit like John McGuinness. It's just always been... Part yeah. of it, do you know what I mean? And it's, uh, yeah. It must have been, I mean, I uh, the TT paddock is busy now for me in my mind, but to have 100, just uh, just sidecars alone, over mm -hmm. 100 sidecars, it must yeah. have been manic. It was, 103. And, but that the year that I started, they still had, had the 750s or I think 1100s they were, and they just brought the 350s in. So I was there on a... On a 350 Yamaha, you know what I mean? So, so explain <clears> this to me, because I'm, I'm still a little unsure on the... The, the classification, the CC of sidecars. During that time, there was three versions of a sidecar you could you could ride. Um, is, that, is that right? Yeah, there was. They, <clears throat> they allowed the long bikes in, but long tubular, not not like the World Championship or BSB bikes, the monocot ones, which are like a piece of ducting with bits hanging off. They were a proper tubular bike with like like with the ones we've got now but mm -hmm. but longer with the engine behind you so that was like the one that, that was like a, steve webster used to race back uh, in the 80s or not no he was, was on he was on the monocot but the the same long right. the same long bike so and they had thousands in them or i think 1200s i think they allowed it mm -hmm. at that point Bloody hell. and then um they had the shorter bikes which is what we've got now but you could have 1100s in them or whatever and then uh, they brought the F2 class out, 
which uh, uh, originally was just um, two strokes, the 350 two strokes. Mm -hmm. But then they allowed them to put 600 cc's in, and I think Mick Boddis was one of the first ones to go to the TT and, and win on one. And then since then, it's been 600 cc. Yeah. And you can't use a long bike anymore. So How different is a two-stroke sidecar to a, to a four-stroke? Is there a lot of difference or not? Yeah, well, they, they used to run uh, 750 Yamahas in, in the, sh the shorter bikes. Mm. So they're, they're probably as much power as, as we've got now, 30, 130 brake or something, or 140. But two-stroke, they, they were fast, but the roads weren't the same. The suspension wasn't the same, do you know what I mean? And I think Jock went round at 108, something like that, on a, on a seven, uh, the 750 or 700 Yamaha. So Four or two-stroke? Uh, two stroke, four cylinder, two stroke. Seven fifty, two stroke. Yeah, yeah. Where did... they must have been a they, they were keeping them going was was a hard well, that's thing. It, yeah, you'd uh, you'd either have them too rich and not be quick enough, or you'd lean them up, you know, and then they'd uh, usually seize. Seize them. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I wonder what that was like. <clears throat> like starting in in Douglas. The, the bike must run completely different in Douglas as it does to the top That's of the, clear, the mountain. Yeah, yeah, and that that was a problem. So the... so somewhere along <clears> the line, you'd have to have it running a bit, like you say, a bit a bit lean or a bit rich yeah, yeah. to make they, sure it gets through. Yeah, they'd, they'd run rich on the bottom to, yeah. to do right, and then they'd, they'd fly over the mountain. But if you got them flying at bo on the bottom, then they'd, yeah, they'd, they'd seize up somewhere. Yeah, you'd, you'd know you were going to head to the mountain yeah. and it was going to nip up. And they, that, used, they used to run them in the side loads as well, 752 yeah. strokes. Did they? Yep. I mm. never knew that. I knew the, 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 obviously I saw the old 500 two strokes and 250s and 125. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mick Grant was a big Kawasaki rider in his Grand Prix and, and TT wise, but he'd run a 750. Uh, he's still got one, I think. Magnesium crankcases and everything. Yeah. But they're terrifying to ride there. <sighs> Not for they, me. They sounded, around there. they sounded lovely though. Oh, and, I bet they did. And warming up and most of, most of them run on Castellar, so it was just oh, a smell. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Him, so what? What about um, you know? Just for my, for the listeners as well, but for me especially, what's the main difference in feel from uh, racing a short chassis uh, sidecar to what you're talking about the, in the older days, a long one? Yeah. Well, I never rode a long tubular, so I I, I can't really comment on that. But the lads who did it said they're, they're very similar to the the short one, but the monocoque bike that we use at BSB and uh, World Championship and that. That has like central steering type thing, and it they steer so well. I mean, and the long uh, ones steer much better than the short. Yes, right. yeah, because right. the the front wheel stays flat on the road, where, whereas on a on an F two because of the steering angle, when you turn the bars, it it kicks onto the edge of the tire, so you don't yeah, have right. full contact with the yeah, you know what I mean with the with the road. So well, so that. corner speed is less or grip levels are less. The the yeah. grip levels are less on an F two. On a on a short bike, then right, yeah, and they run they run bigger tires, and it's just yeah. Um, Tim Reeves took a, a a long bike to the TT and did a, a few laps on it or a, a lap just to a demonstration. One, one of these monocot ones, mm. and, and all they are is like a big like a piece of duct in riveted together, and mm -hmm. I think it it wouldn't have survived three laps. I don't think so. <laughs> really? That, no, I don't think so. No, yeah. they're, they're not they're not built for that. So, but. so the big question is why why sidecars? Like most people, will, they'll have a, a pedigree of it in the family. But if if your dad was just a fan, why why did you go down the sidecar route and not not solos? Well, <clears> I, <throat> I wish I'd gone down the solo route. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, it was the people, uh, I, had a, I had a friend nearby and he had a sidecar and I passengered for him at a, a place called Longridge, which was, now it's just a caravan park, but there was a little little track there and I passengered mm. for him. And uh, that was on a, a, a sidecar with an Ilman Imp engine in it. The oh, car, the car I've, I've raced one really? of them. Yeah, have you really? Yeah. 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 Good thing. There was a, a, an aluminium engine, four cylinder overhead cam. At, at the time, they were fairly, um, I don't know, ahead of the game. Mm. You know what I mean? You to you to have a different drive system on and, and run them through a, a Norton gearbox or something. But but that's how it was. But yeah, I rode I rode with him, and uh, I thought, no, this isn't this isn't for me. So I, that was it. But I got the bug. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I wanted I wanted to go sidecar. So I went I went and bought my first sidecar in. 
which is uh, a long while ago. And I went down with uh, <clears throat> a guy called uh, Norman Burgess, who you, you probably know, helps Birdie out a bit, and but he used to race. I went with him and I went with uh, his friend, uh, Brian Hargreaves, bless him, and he used to race at TT, but he's, he's not with us anymore. And uh, we went to buy this, this sidecar and uh, coming back, we bought it coming back and, and uh, I got done for speed in 110 because they were they were egging me on to come on <laughs> if you're going to rate you need to <laughs> <laughs> and then and then we went in the motorway services and the proper characters these two and Brian Argreaves who was with me was was a boxer so they had a few beers in back of the car and that and they, they jumped on the table in the middle of the motorway services and Norman says who wants to fight pretty boy Argreaves and <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so yeah it was, it was good but that was it that was literally oh, that was it. <clears throat> going going from a passenger you went i'm not having this i want to i want to be in control of this machine yeah so yeah when i got it i, I took it to mallory park and and it was a bsa a65 and i didn't know but all the all the oil had drained out of the oil tank into the crankcases so i got i got to mallory i couldn't start it we we're just full of oil yeah. So I, I came home, and that was that was the, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, great but, start. So yeah. nine seventy. Can you remember what you paid for it? Nineteen seventy nine. I think about six hundred pounds. Yeah, something flipping like that. it. Yeah, bargain. Yeah. Fidham and BSA. Wow. Ten inch wheels. Do you know what I mean? Just it, it was a modern one because he used to have sixteen inch front wheels earlier. You know, like yeah. But uh, yeah. And and the and the. The idea was always to go to the TT with it, or was it just a Not, race? No, it was just a race, but it, I wanted to go to the TT, but that wasn't the bike to do it with, you know what I mean? So, right. So you had you had your sights set on the TT? Yeah, yeah, and you wanted it was, to... yeah, it was always going to be the TT. Yeah. So after the BSA, I bought myself an Ilman Imp, mm -hmm. and then after that, uh, I, I sold the Imp, and then I bought, it was a Honda 6, a CBX six-cylinder in a... That's a big lump to That's have. A, yeah, yeah. I mean, cuff, luckily I'm a, a big guy and I could reach round the <laughs> round the engine to the handlebars, <laughs> but that were fantastic. And at the time I was racing then with Steve Webster and that when he was mm -hmm. sort of starting club racing, and he he was on a a, a kettle a, a 750 yeah. Suzuki, two stroke thing. Yeah, but, yeah. but my Honda Six had just I it was push start. You jump on it and to go. Well, I I went at first corner before he chimed his two stroke yeah. up and. And they were, you know, like five or six laps. So we had some right good races. Push we... starts on a on a sidecar as well. Yeah. Back in day. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. We yeah. push start. Yeah. So you didn't have to do anything though, did you? Or did you, yeah, run, you run at run the side of it and then jump run in? Run at the side and jump on. Yeah. All right. Weren't down to the passenger pushing. No, it. no, no. They're lazy, aren't they? Well, I suppose again, <laughs> ma massive <laughs> no. old lump in it to to get fired yeah. up. But that beauty of that on the <clears> six, <throat> it would it would one of the cylinders would chime up. Yeah. You, know what mean? It. <laughs> you had six. You had six chances. Six chances. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I think one was raced at the TT, but uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that was when I got into serious-ish bikes. Mm. You, know I mean? you mentioned the name there, Steve Webster, yes. uh, a massive name in sidecar yeah. racing. I'm a big fan. Um, and for me, I'm digging for information here because, you know, he's, in my opinion, he's such an easygoing, uh, lovely, lovely fellow. Great block. A bit like uh, Dave Thorpe from the motocross world, a yeah. world champion, fabulous. Too nice to be an aggressive racer. Great what block. was Webbo like to race against? He was real hard, but clean. He he wouldn't, yeah, he was a gentleman on track, but any gap or anything, you know, and, and his preparation was good. And he got some good backing eventually. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Dennis Trollope and them helped him win a world championship and set him off. But Steve was great, and he had his brother with him at the beginning when I when I started racing. And then Tony Hewitt That's right. uh, went, yeah. went with Steve. But we were great, great pals. We it was club racing, and we'd spend a lot of time together. It were great. Good times, you know. And and I think pff, they always kind of. Uh, Sidecar teams had a, always had a kind of a bit of a reputation for uh, living it up in the in paddock well, life. Yeah, yeah. When <laughs> when I went to the TT at the beginning, um, it, not as serious as it is now. We used to do uh, uh, morning practice as well, mm -hmm. but we'd be off. We'd, we'd be downtown. Do you know what I mean? Till silly o'clock, and, and <laughs> just just it's so different now. The the you know, but. It did you ever fun. did you ever ro roll out of the pub or the club? No, no, because I'm I'm an athlete. An athlete, yeah, of course. Yeah. But and people uh, did. 
people did, yeah. What, and straight out of the club, straight just about, into the yeah, they, boom. Yeah, they, they, they'd be out, yeah, <laughs> and then uh, come up and rub their eyes and away they go. Keep the visor up as they're going down just to wake themselves up and then boom, they didn't breathalyse in them days. Cause, <clears> it, <throat> but it, it'd be a field yeah. of one. It'd just be you on the start line. It were good. It was, yeah, but not safe, obviously, and yeah. that's not the way to do it. But And it's not good for the sport. It's not good for our image or anything like that. But, uh, it's good for the stories, though. Now it, now it doesn't happen, we can talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we can talk about it. That's yeah. what it was like. Yeah. So give us names, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the worst? Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Silence. Yeah, no. So I was going to ask you the question, you know, how far... You said you set off at the TT racing with no kind of aspirations for winning, but, you know, fourth place at your first TT, you must have fairly quickly realised you, you yeah. could be competitive and good enough to stand on that top step. I'd done quite a lot of work, and, and I said I've been there since a kid, so I, I knew a, a lot, a lot of way around. You know what I mean? But I don't know. It just seemed to fit with me. I, I, I live in the countryside, and I was riding around sort of country lanes and that. Mm. So it, it just it didn't feel wrong. Do you know what I mean? It was, and uh, I think I think because I loved it so much, I felt it easy to to learn it, and it wasn't. It wasn't hard. It, and I don't mean that disrespectful to the place, but it wasn't hard to learn it or mm. or to put the effort in to learn it. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, it, so, yeah, fourth place, and I thought, oh, yeah, we're all right here. And, and then it went on. And um, in 2006, I think, I met, um, I were running bikes that weren't really competitive and that. And then uh, in 2006, I sold my house, split up from my wife, I think, and then I bought bought an LCR sidecar, and they went went to the TT. You think? And, well, I, you I think you did. I can't remember things. You see, <laughs> so I'll like, be married. Oh yeah, <laughs> Is that what you say. No, I, well, <laughs> I've two most, wives. You see, I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> most teams find it hard to kind of pay the season off and work through the winter to, and find a budget for the next season but it's a little bit drastic getting a divorce to sell the house yeah, no, to I, get some money to no, buy a chair I, for the next year yeah I didn't, I didn't get divorced <laughs> to sell the house to get, but it, it happened <laughs> yeah so yeah and then but in my early days I, I was married to some uh, somebody's daughter and he was a millionaire he was called Tommy Ball he used to sell shoes and that but he just wasn't interested in in, in bikes, mm. so I, he never put a penny f towards it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But that was so frustrating because, you know. So I got shut of her because it wasn't. <laughs> it that wasn't, didn't wasn't going to pay. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no. So yeah, and then say so yeah, I bought I bought my first bike when this LCR went to the TT. Spoke to uh, Hector Neil, and uh, that was before I we went, and he. He said, uh, well, we'll paint it in relentless colours because I, well, I was saying to Steve when Cam Donald and Bruce yeah. were, were running in the relentless colours. He said, I'll give you a grand. He said, and we'll get we'll get some of it off relentless. We'll be right. And they never got anything off relentless or anybody else, but it was just Hector, bless him. And mm. he gave me a grand and that just helped, helped on, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so going back to, to starting... <clears throat> I always find it fascinating, especially nowadays, how different the, the learning process is. Obviously, they don't just let anybody go no. and, and hope for the best. But back in the day, I guess they did. So how did, how did you go about it? Because you didn't have the likes of Milky saying, stay right here, watch for this lamppost, watch for this turning in point, no. stuff like that. How, or video games. Or, yeah, exactly. Or, or yeah, there's no, there was, it no, was literally just to do, driving. You used to drive round it, yeah. yeah. And uh, first time I went there, I went with David Burgess and we had this video camera and we tried to... <laughs> That must have been a big thing back yeah, in those days. Yeah, filled the fill front seat of the car. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you remember when uh, Mick Bodice did some filming or Joey, they had a big battery pack on the back. Didn't that's they? right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so, well, yeah. yeah but cool. we went yeah. off with this thing and went flying over the laugh bridge. And I still still laugh now because all, all, all it is was like you could just see roof of the car. <laughs> <and then. laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was no help at all then. That no, video. there were no. It wasn't. It was just a laugh. <laughs> but we, I used to have uh, daft things in my head. You know what I mean? Like Glen Vine's fine. It, you know, I try and learn it like that. Yeah. Cro Crosby's fast because Graham Cos Crosby. You know what I mean? Like that. Yeah, yeah. Just, just things just to 
yeah, and that's how I, how I learned. Just to, to remind you when you're just, actually sleeping. Yeah, when you're out, just, yeah. yeah, just, yeah. But things like, obviously, a lot of people, uh, like Milky says, especially on a solo, going over Crosby, even I know, you stick to the right. I don't know if it's the same nowadays, but the, the only way to learn that, surely, back then was to, to experience it and, and do it. Yeah, but you've got to remember that then the bikes weren't as fast. Like, yeah, I, I suppose, probably, yeah. I think my... I think for sure I did a 97 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's 117, 18, 19, whatever. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, it wasn't as fast. So I think you had a bit more time to, things weren't coming at you just as quick. Yeah. So. And did you have a lot of people around you like, the, the youngsters coming in now have, have the likes of you, Molly, the Birchills <clears throat> to, 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 to speak of, to get that experience? Yeah, yeah. Who, who, who did you go and see? Savile, Dave Savile, he he was he was doing it. I mean, he he helped me out a bit, and oh, it just. But it's not like it is now. Do you know what I mean? It was. Is that a good so, thing or a bad thing, though? It, well, I think it was more fun then. Now mm -hmm. it's a bit more serious. So, but I, I don't think one was better than the other. Yeah, I like it both ways. Do you know what I mean? But I think I prefer it now because sidecars have really come to the forefront, and yeah, I think they're. As good a spectacle as as a solo. Oh, oh, absolutely! Obviously, I'm experienced on two wheels, uh, and you've done a bit on. Yeah, you've done it. Haven't you? I've, I've, I've sampled, you yeah, know, passenger uh, around the world. Luckily, with 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 Ben Ben Birchall. Um But how much work does it take to get a sidecar set up to lap the TT course? To be honest, you you don't need to change it much from short circuit because. Because it's so flat and smooth over the over the, the mountain and that, you've you've got to have it fairly stiff anyhow. And it won't go round left handers if it, if you think right, when they soften it up for for the bumps and, and things like that. They just just don't go around left handers and there's a lot of left handers at Alaman, so you need it quite suspension quite firm. Similar to the to the raw you know, the, mm. the, the normal uh, circuits. But it's just the preparation, you've just it's amazing how many stop because a gear lever's fallen off or just daft little things. So you've got to cover things like that because you're you're out for an hour, it's bumpy. They, they really get hammered. So, yeah, it's it's more the, the attention to detail to, to prep them that they don't fall to bits or come loose or or whatever. That you know, that's the, the main difference. But a setup, I could I could take mine to, to Donington and then take it to the Isle of Man and it, it wouldn't be a lot different. So out of the forty-seven, I've got I've got some stats here, and we check we check well, before. I, I am. <laughs> All right, let's. I've got my stats. You've got your stats. You read you read your well, stats I, out to me. I didn't know my stats. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for the listeners and the viewers, um, John said at the start of the pod just before we started. Um, I, d I don't know any of my stats. I don't know any of my results <laughs> apart from my wins. I don't know any of my, all my results. So I, I reached out. So who was it you reached out to? There's a, a friend of mine, John Newton, who used to be the, the press secretary for the FSRA, Former Sidecar <clears throat> Racing Association, and he's a friend of mine. But he, every now and again, he'll put some stats out on. We have a, a, a Steve's place. It's called where all the sidecar people mm -hmm. look at it. Like, so I, I asked him. Can you tell me my stats? Because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we started, you said it might be an age thing. Well, maybe, but once it, well, in my mind, once it, once something's done, it's done, and then move on. Yeah. And I think that's how I. Uh, yeah. how I uh, so how many how many how many starts have you got over there? Well, it says forty-eight races starts. And how many finishes? Thirty-nine. Right, Steve. What have we got? What have you got? 47 starts. No, 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 no. 38, <laughs> 38 finishes. Well, no. He'll be right. You'll be wrong. Who's he a, says... Who's our statistician, though? Don't worry. Oh, Phil, I'm, I know you'll be listening, Phil. I'm with you. I'm with you, buddy. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not singing my own praises, but, but 48 races, 21 podiums, 39 finishes, and until 2019, I was the second quickest, and then... Uh, well, after 2019, then COVID came along, and then last year it just didn't happen for me, and I was the second quickest. Yeah, round there. Well, we've got 21 podiums as well, so. Oh, well, we're all right with that. We, aren't yeah, we? that, that's the that's the main <laughs> that's thing. That's the main thing. It? Yeah, yeah, um, and two wins, and two wins. The last, and until last year, 2022, I had 12 podiums on the bounce. Yeah, which it's no means for no, He says, uh, John says. 
Peter Aikman's next best with seven on the bounce, and he got six in 2022. There you go. So that's all right, isn't it? And that's... then my first 110 mile an hour was in 2006, which is quite a long while ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's, there's some people still struggle to do 110 now. So yeah. So we were yeah. The main reason I was asking that is is coming back to those finishers. Obviously, we've had um, a few non finishers. And you were talking there about gear levers or stupid things that have that have come off a, a bike. What's the what's the cheapest or the smallest part that's that stopped you from from finishing a race? I think it was a cam sensor, just something, just a, a sensor failed and uh, out of the blue, nothing like that. Yeah, and something you couldn't, you'd you, never foresee it. No, you couldn't, you couldn't prevent it happening. It's just it's either works or it doesn't. You, mm -hmm. you know, you can you can put new ones on and that, but. Things fail, don't they? Yeah, and inevitably, racing around the the the, the TT course <laughs> comes with its dangers and and the the potentials of of crashes. But we've only ever had two two around there. Yeah, and you had a, a passenger fallout at Laurel Bank. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it it wasn't his fault. I, Is it I, your I, fault? I bashed him on the wall. Yeah. So. Did you? Yeah, it was a shame. Really, that year we were. Uh, <laughs> I bet he thought it was a shame. Yeah. <laughs> Bless him, yeah. Rod Pierce, is yeah, yeah. Like called. He, uh, Rod Fisher was quickest under the nine something. We were second quickest under the nine something, and in the race at Laurel Bank, just got a bit too close, and he just slashed. There was a little like a sharp bit of uh, slate sticking out, and just sliced his bun. That was enough. Yeah, and yeah, it fairly cut him, and then he. He, he got that disease where it didn't heal up, do you know what I mean? So the lad was, he was in a mess with it. It just didn't oh, heal hell. up and he was in hospital for quite a while. Wow. Must have got some dirt in it or something off the wall, so. Do yeah. you know, it's, so with something like that, do you know instantly that the passenger's out the back? Does the bike completely well, he didn't, change he didn't, feel? Or? He didn't fall off, he just right. tapped me and we, we stopped, <clears> so he didn't, didn't actually fall out. Right. And then, uh, so I think that was my, my uh, second incident. My first incident, uh, Brandywell, I went over the edge there, wiped all the, the bollards out and ended up, ended up down in the bottom Bra where, against the wagon. Whereabouts is Brandywell? Up oh. on, it's not up on the mountain, is it? Yeah. Flipping it, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a fast left-hander and it just drifted out, got on the grass. Just and on the exit, there's some <coughs> bollards all sticking up. Yeah, right. Flat up and I've hit the bollard. Yeah, it's, yeah fast. It, it's fast and it just sucks you in. You just you sure and go around there faster and I didn't. Right, but we crashed in. That was in the first race, and we repaired it and went out in the second race. So that, yeah. that was all right. And then um, my last crash was in two thousand and twelve, and we'd we'd won. No, two thousand thirteen. Anyhow, we'd 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 won on twelve. I've got twelve. 12 is it? Yeah, we'd yeah. won on on uh, the Suzuki. And at the time, the Kawasaki's were were going really well. This so right, we'll put a Kawasaki in, but I just. I couldn't just couldn't get it to all together. Every time I went out, it would it would blow up or whatever. And I think it's just the design of the Kawasaki. The clutch is really low down. So in, in the sidecar, you have the engine low down with a flat sump. But I think the, the clutch was churning up the oil and it, it just kept blowing up. So mm. I, I blew everything up, went, went out in the first race and uh, got to Braddon Bridge and... It, it itself yeah and then uh, <laughs> so that were that so until wednesday then that was that was on the saturday until wednesday because we raced wednesday then so i borrowed somebody's suzuki engine somebody sent me a loom over uh so we we got it up and running but oh no that were from and then yeah we that were raced saturday and on a monday we had a practice so we got it ready for monday Went out Monday and this thing were flying. Mm. And uh, I was behind Dave and I, I caught Molly up and, and, and passed him. And then going up Waterworks too, I just shoved it into the wall there and I really hurt myself then. Did uh, you? Yeah. I, I, I bust all my ribs, tore my liver, punctured my lung, bust my hip, um, my shoulder, I disc, uh, broke my collarbone and that. But I can remember Andy Winkle was on with me. I remember lying in the road. And uh, I'm sort of there, and I said, Andy, just get it sorted. We'll be right for Wednesday. <laughs> 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 what a clown. We'd, 
all I need to do was follow Dave over the hill. We all, you know what I mean? And yeah. and we'd have been ready for for Wednesday. But no, I got Dave. I'm gonna I'm gonna show Dave to start to go over the hill. But it, no. And fine. was An was Andy okay? Passing Andy was were okay. fine. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. Oh, flipping it. Yeah. No, he were fine. And, and another funny story. <laughs> they put me in the helicopter, and. Um, they like put a, a brace over you, don't they? But I still got my earplugs in, and I got I got into the hospital, and I could see this woman like talking to me. I couldn't. I thought I'd lost my hearing. I just I thought I just I, I didn't know what was going on. I can't hear you. <laughs> earplugs still in. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's funny. Oh. It, well, it's not funny. But when you had a crash and a bang on the head as well, some, the way your head works sometimes it's yeah. mental. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just been. I, I, I crashed at Brands Hatch once, massive crash in qualifying at World Supersport. And, um, Whereabouts? Oh. Dingle Dell. <clears throat> and I cartwheel oh, into yeah. a massive load of bales. Um, it, Eurosport showed it a weekend. It was a horrendous looking crash. I was actually all right at the end of it. But I was buried under loads of bales. I couldn't see anything. So everything's completely black and I'm laid there. I couldn't move because there, there's so much weight on me. And I could hear Marshall shouting, but it's completely black. And I just thought, well, that's it. That's, I'm dead. I go, it's weird, isn't it? How, yeah. Uh, how your head works. And yeah. Then, and it's like, hey, there's only a few seconds, five seconds. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, bit of daylight, a bale of a bit of daylight. Uh, oh, no, I'm still alive. Weird, weird how your yeah. flipping head works. And you just in a situation like that. You're hurting. I had a job to breathe because I'd damn it. But hmm. you don't really feel the pain just for the beginning, do you? I think no. the adrenaline's wasn't around adrenaline. you. Yeah. yeah, who, and, who, who yeah was, sure. Someone else was saying that on, <clears throat> was it Milo Ward? I think it was, wasn't it? At the, the crash at Aberdeer. He was saying yeah. in a previous podcast, he I said, think. I didn't feel anything, and I thought I'd, he hit, I'd done something. He hit the tree, the big oak tree yeah. at Aberdeer. Yeah, he said for, for a few seconds he couldn't feel anything. It's a good job, isn't it, really? Else? Well, that's it. I guess that's the, your, your, body's, your, your body's mechanism. Yeah. Before we wrap up part one, the, the, the one question I wanted to ask, especially f going on from that, um, that crash, how, as a, as a driver of a sidecar, how responsible do you feel for, for the passenger? Like, is there a, yeah. is there a bit of a... A, a chat beforehand saying, I'm going to do everything I'm going to, if something happens, we, well, both, well, un we both understand that it is what you, it is. You both, yeah. Exactly or, is it, or is it not spoken about and you kind of take it for granted? You do take it for granted, but mm. we both know what we're letting ourselves in for and it's got to be a trust thing both ways, hasn't it? And I don't think they'd jump on with you if, uh, if they didn't think they were going to come home. Mm. But... It is a responsibility, and especially when they've, you know, I'm, I've had a, quite a few passengers, and some have got children and that, and wives are there and kids are there. You know, you think like, is this the right thing to do? Then you sort of tell yourself, well, they wouldn't be doing it if they didn't want to do it, and I did it when I had my kids, and mm. so, yeah, what? Well, it's it's just how it is, isn't it? Really, yeah. You can't, yeah. If I think if you did think about it too much. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do it, yeah. and you wouldn't race. So. Right. But, mm. Let's wrap up part one, and we'll get to part two. We'll talk about your other half because yes, she does we a, bit need, of, a little we, bit of racing. We need to talk about our Fiona, yeah, and uh, and your TT twenty twenty two. Obviously, it didn't go to uh, no nope. to plan. No, and we're twenty three. We need to talk about that as well. Got loads to talk about. Right, <clears throat> join us in part two next week.